Good afternoon and welcome to the Sustainable Futures Speaker Series at Humboldt State University. Um, this series dates back to 2005. Uh, it's an interdisciplinary series that has stimulated collaboration around issues related to energy, the environment, and society. All events are free and open to the public and are sponsored by the Schatz Energy Research Center, the Environment and Community uh, Graduate Program, and the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences. Um, as we begin, I would like to acknowledge uh, that Humboldt State University and the place where I am located tonight are in the ancestral territory of the Wiat people. Um, there are three federally recognized tribes within this ancestral territory, um, including the Wiat tribe, the Bear River Band of the Ronerville Rancheria, and the Blue Lake Rancheria. Um, and uh, all three of these tribes have played leadership roles in areas related to energy, uh, the environment, and society, the theme of this series. Um, today, I'd like to acknowledge in particular the Blue Lake Rancheria tribe uh, for their leadership uh, in relationship to um, uh, uh, clean energy and uh, environmental protection. The Blue Lake Rancheria uh, has set a target of achieving zero net carbon by 2030. Their nationally recognized work on renewable energy microgrids is part of this effort, uh, along with multiple other activities. Um, and so uh, really just want to uh, acknowledge and appreciate um, uh, the Blue Lake Rancheria tonight. Um, in this fall's uh, speaker series, uh, we're glad to present uh, six uh, different talks that together tackle a broad range of sustainability goals. Uh, tonight's speaker is author and activist Bill McKibben, co-founder of 350.org, who will explore with us what we can still do amidst the current state of uh, climate change. Um, upcoming on November 4th, Sam Ahrens, Director of Sustainability at Lyft, will discuss uh, his vision on the road ahead for shared uh, electric vehicles. On November 18th, we'll be joined by William Bauer of the University of Nevada, who will talk about uh, his new text on California Native history. And we'll close out the season on December 2nd with Tracy Bryn uh, Voyles, who will introduce us to her new book on California's Salton Sea and the consequences of colonialism. Uh, the latest information plus registration for upcoming webinars can be found at shotcenter.org slash speakers and the Environment and Community Department website. And uh, we'll drop those links into the chat for, for those who are interested. Um, uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, uh, if you'd like to ask a question of today's speaker, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, the presentation will be followed by a, a Q&A discussion. Um, if you have any technical difficulties, please use the chat box uh, to send a message to, uh, to us and we'll um, do our best to try and help you resolve the problem. Um, we do have live captioning tonight provided by AI services and want to give a big thank you to the captioning team for joining us tonight. And uh, with that, I will pass things over to my uh, uh, colleague, uh, Jennifer Marlowe uh, of the Environmental Science and Management Department. Um, and uh, um, uh, Jen will uh, introduce tonight's speaker. So over to you, Jen. Thanks, Artie, and welcome to everyone. Bill McKibben is a contributing writer to The New Yorker. He's a founder of the grassroots climate campaign 350.org and the Schumann Distinguished Professor in Residence at Middlebury College in Vermont. He was a 2014 recipient of the Right Livelihood Prize, sometimes called the Alternative Noble, and the Gandhi Peace Award. He has written over a dozen books about the environment, including his first, The End of Nature, published 30 years ago. And his most recent, Falter, has the human game begun to play itself out. His latest project is a new organization called Third Act, 
aimed at engaging activists over age 60 working for a fair and stable planet. Learn more at thirdact.org. On a personal note, I've known Bill for 20 years. He was a college mentor of mine at Middlebury College. He helped me get my first job at Orion Magazine. He picked me up once after I'd hiked the long trail in Vermont, hungry for a shower and a meal. There are two people in my life who always answer the phone when I call, my mom and Bill. And I'm always surprised when he picks up or when he writes back. It demonstrates to me his commitment, not only to our friendship, but more importantly, to consistently and constantly answering the larger call of what to do about climate change, of engaging in conversations like these with us, so that efforts to address climate change feel both at once strategic and necessary, but also deeply human and act of love. So welcome to HSU, Bill. And I wanna just say to our attendees that this evening's talk is being recorded and it will be available online later this month at shotscenter.org backslash speakers. So welcome, Bill, it's so good to have you here. Jen, first of all, enormous thanks for that very, very, very kind introduction, and what a pleasure to see you. You're one of the reasons, one of the three reasons that I'm really specially happy to be with you this all tonight. The second is uh, the Shot Center and Arnie, where I've spent uh, a couple of very, very fruitful and interesting days a few years back when I was getting ready to go do some reporting on renewable energy in the developing world. And it was uh, eye opening uh, to get to see where so much of this technology, but also insight about how to put it to use had come from. Um, and people at, at, at Humboldt should be very, very proud of the work that's done there. Um, there's really did um, um, lead the world in down a path that as I will describe is turning out to be the path that the world has to be on. And the third reason I'm really happy is because yesterday, uh, the California State University system announced that it was all divesting from fossil fuel, uh, joining the UC system and doing the same thing. And that's something that many, many, many people, myself included, have worked toward for a very long time. And we were very, very happy to see it happening. So with all those happy introductions, um, let me turn to uh, the very unhappy beginning of this talk. Um, I'm always the worst person to invite to give a talk because basically my work in the world involves bumming people out. Um, and I will do it for a little while um, before we sort of try to get to a happier place. But you guys are going to be talking about what we're going to do to make a sustainable future um, in uh, all year long. So in order to figure out what the scale and the pace of the solutions that are required are, one has to know the scale and the pace of the crisis that we're in. And so I'll just talk about that as straightforwardly as I can for a minute. Uh, I know this is stuff that people know, but it, it's the most important thing that ever happened. So it's worth sort of getting on the same page every now and again. I wrote the first book about climate change for a general audience, came out 32 years ago now, I guess, in 1989. And truthfully, we knew most of what we needed to know about global warming back then. Um, our basic understanding has not shifted very much. We knew then that burning coal and gas and oil put carbon dioxide at quantity into the atmosphere. We knew its molecular structure trapped heat that would otherwise radiate back out to space. And by the late 1980s, it was clear that the process of heating the planet had begun. The only thing we didn't know really was exactly how fast and how hard this was going to bite. And the truth is it's bitten harder and faster even than, than we suspected. I mean, I was not very optimistic about it. I wrote a book after all called The End of Nature. But um, still, the pace at which change has come 
is quite remarkable. Let's just review in the most basic terms. Human beings have raised the temperature of the earth one degree Celsius. <clears throat> that doesn't sound like an enormous amount, but it turns out to be a lot. Uh, if you think about it in other units, it gets easier sometimes to understand. <clears throat> The extra heat that we trap each day uh, because of the carbon we've put in the atmosphere is the rough heat equivalent of 500,000 Hiroshima-sized explosions every day. And so if you think about it in units like that, it gets easier to understand, for instance, how we've melted most of the ice in the summer Arctic, uh, taken this eons-old continent-sized meters-thick sheet of ice it was one of the four or five dominant features of our planet and turned most of it into slush. Um, um, and in the process, of course, amped up the whole process because the nice white shield that used to reflect much of the incoming solar radiation back out to space is now blue seawater that absorbs it. Um, um, this in turn has caused all kinds of other interesting problems. Uh, uh, some of your colleagues there in California Jennifer Francis in particular have done great work to demonstrate the fact that a melting Arctic is the thing that has thrown the jet stream into confusion and dismay, uh, locking it in these high amplitude patterns that are producing long periods of drought or downpour, depending on which side of yourself you find them on. The melting Arctic is also apparently, and this is new data from this year, uh, managed to, by injecting a lot of fresh water into the North Atlantic, slow the pace of the Gulf Stream by about 15% already. Uh, the Gulf Stream is another large physical phenomenon. The volume of water it carries from the equators to the pole is roughly 100 times the size of the Amazon River. So the, change, the point I'm trying to make is the changes that we're making already are not minor. They're not around the edges. They're, not, they're already going to the very heart of the most fundamental physical systems on Earth. I realize I don't really need to persuade Californians of that fact because you all are witness to one of the first great demonstrations of climate change in action. Uh, the principle that warm air holds more water vapor than cold is demonstrated, I'm afraid, with great frequency now in the Golden State. Um, when these periods of extreme aridity combine with super high temperatures, and the last two years we've recorded the highest temperature ever recorded on the planet in California in the summer uh, at Death Valley at 130 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, but that's obviously been enough to uh, kick off these massive firestorms of a scale and of uh, intensity that we haven't seen before. And truthfully, they're, as you know, all too well, they are terrifying um, in their immediate effects and they are terrifying in their implications. <clears throat> Those of us in the Eastern US were able to look up most of the summer and see skies turned hazy by that cloud of particulates <clears throat> drifting east from the great fires of the West. Um, once that water has evaporated up into the atmosphere, obviously it comes down. The average residence time for a molecule of water vapor in the atmosphere is only about seven days. And so it comes down in downpour. Um, where I live in the Northeastern United States, we've seen roughly a 50% increase in the number of storms that drop two inches of rain in 24 hours, the kind of gully washing storms that do nobody any good. I was in New York City three, four weeks ago tonight when the remnants of Hurricane Ida broke every rainfall record in New York City history dating back, well, the records they smashed had been set 11 days earlier um, um, with the remnants of Hurricane Henry. But the record keeping goes back 150 years and we're breaking those records, not by small increments, but by massive amounts. The scariest moment really of the whole year may have been what happened just a little bit north of you in June with the massive heat wave 
that hit the Pacific Northwest and Canada. Uh, there were parts of Alberta and British Columbia where the temperature reached 121 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, hotter than it's ever been, for instance, in Florida, um, 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 and probably hotter than it's been in what's now Canada since the Pleistocene. Uh, it's no accident that the town that set that record then burned to the ground the next day. Um, that's what climate change feels like right now at one degree. And every day something happens. Yesterday, we smashed the European record for rainfall in a 24-hour period with an exceptional storm in Italy. Uh, tomorrow, it will be someplace else. Um, <laughs> That's not the scary part of the story. The scary part of the story is that one degree Celsius is still fairly near the beginning of this global warming saga. And we're currently on a path to increase the temperature of the planet on our current trajectories, even if we kept the promises that we made in Paris, uh, uh, the, the temperature would go up three degrees Celsius uh, in the course of this century. Um, and if we let that happen, then it's very clear that we will not have civilizations like the ones we're used to having. The level of violent, chaotic flux is simply too great to be absorbed. I mean, it, it's, you know, the, the metrics that we try to anticipate are so off the charts wild that they hardly even bear thinking about. The UN High Commission on Refugees estimates that unchecked global warming this century could produce a billion climate refugees. Uh, even to think about that is absurd. I mean, a million refugees streaming into Western Europe discombobulated the politics of an entire continent. A, a, a million refugees showing up on our southern border had a hell of a lot to do with the fact that uh, 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 we elected Donald Trump president and almost lost our democracy in the process. So try to imagine what happens when there are flows of people a thousand times that size. Uh, the economic uh, projections for uh, uh, global warming on that scale are, of course, hard to make, but the high end of the most recent ones say that the economic damage would be about $551 trillion, which is more money than currently exists on our planet. Um, um, the point I'm trying to make is the single biggest job that humans have ever undertaken, the single most important effort we will ever make, will be to try and hold that temperature increase as far below that as possible, as far below two degrees as possible, if it is still possible to hold it below there, as close to a degree and a half as we can get. Um, and this will be an extraordinary fight to, to even have a chance of doing that. We've been given a kind of outline of what it would take and a deadline by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, the people that we ask to monitor the world's climate for us. And what they told us in 2018 was that we need to cut emissions in half around the world by 2030 if we want to have a chance of hitting those targets around 1.5 degrees Celsius that we set in Paris. Again, that would not be an optimal outcome. If one degree Celsius melts the Arctic, we're fools to find out what a degree and a half or two degrees will do. But we're going to find out. You know, Our hope is that we don't go beyond that. But it's going to be a very difficult hope to meet because 2030 is eight years and change away. Okay? The, the final point I want to make just in this litany of gloom that I'm giving you is that this would be all be bad enough if the devastation was being weighed out in some proportion to the people who had caused and profited from it. But in fact, it works exactly the opposite. There's an almost perfect linear relationship between how little you did to cause climate change and how much of the pain you get hammered with. The iron law of global warming is the less you did to cause it, the sooner and the harder you get hit. Um, so this is the greatest challenge to justice that we have ever seen in our, in our world. And that's saying a lot, considering the other ways we've figured out to challenge uh, a just world. Uh, 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 over the centuries. So, so that's the bad news. 
Um, let me give you two pieces of good news that counter that a little bit, that allow us to hope that we really have some things that we could still do here. The first is one that the Humboldt has played, as I said before, a really important part in getting off the ground. And that is the rapid rise of renewable energy. Um, you know, from the pioneering work made possible, I think, in part by, um, you know, uh, 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 local weed growers showing up with bags of cash wanting to know about solar panels. Uh, this has become the most important growth industry that the world has ever seen. In the last decade, the price of solar power and of wind power has dropped by an order of magnitude. This is now the cheapest way to generate power on planet Earth, which is very, very good news because this is the direction we need to go and with enormous speed. Um, here's a way to say it. The biggest job of human beings over the next decade is to figure out how to stop burning things on planet Earth, how to end the combustion of <clears throat> coal and gas and oil and wood on an industrial scale, and rely instead on the fact that the good Lord put a large burning ball of fire 93 million miles away in the sky. And thanks to the good brains of people like those at the Schott Center, we now know how to make use of that burning ball of gas in order to power our lives directly through solar panels, slightly indirectly through the turbines that capture the effect of differential heating in the form of wind. And, and those things are now enough uh, to uh, economically power the world that we have, especially since, and again, we have Californians to thank about this in no small part, uh, 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 especially since the development of batteries has come apace with that uh, and their price is falling at the same rate. And it is remarkable to see that going on. Um, in other words, there's no longer a technical or economic barrier that prevents us from doing what needs to be done. In fact, all the economics really point in the right direction. There was an enormously important study that came out 10 days ago from Oxford that attempted to delineate uh, what the costs of various forms of this transition would be. And they found that by far the most, the cheapest way to make uh, this energy transformation is to do it very fast, uh, to go as fast as is possible. And when I say it's much cheaper, they're measuring that in tens of trillions of dollars. And if you think about it for a while, you can figure out the reason why the sooner we move from a system based on fuel that you have to pay someone to dig up over and over and over again and keep burning, and instead move to a system based on a fuel that appears each morning when the sun rises above the horizon, is the sooner we're going to get to a, a, a economically sensible uh, energy system. And that is before you take into account the incomprehensible cost of allowing global climate change to continue on its present course. So that's one piece of good news. The second piece of good news to understand why it's even good news or necessary uh, requires us to take a little detour. Um, you would think given the scale of the problem that we face, the biggest problem there's ever been, and given the fact that there is a solution, you would think we would be absolutely uh, working overtime to embrace that solution, that that would become the main goal, the main work of human beings on this planet would be to quickly spread renewable energy as fast as we can. That it isn't is testament to the fact that we don't run this planet on reason alone. We run it to a very large degree on vested interest. And that vested interest in the form of the fossil fuel industry has been enough for 30 years to stop us from making a transition that we know we need to make. Um, um, 
we really, we, we kind of sensed this for a long time, but it was really only five or six years ago that great journalism allowed us to know it for sure. Uh, people at the Pulitzer Prize winning website Inside Climate News at the LA Times at the Columbia Journalism School put together the work in the archives and with whistleblowers and things to prove beyond any shadow of a doubt that the fossil fuel industry had known everything there was to know about climate change back in the 1980s. Uh, companies like Exxon were studying it uh, full bore. And at the time, Exxon was the biggest company in the world, and they had a great staff of scientists, and their product was carbon. So of course, they were going to figure out what was going on. And they did figure out. In those archives, they found predictions for what the temperature would be in 2020 that were absolutely spot on, uncannily accurate. Not only were these scientists telling their executives that, they were believed. Companies like Exxon began building all their drilling rigs higher to compensate for the rise in sea level that they knew was in the offing. The only thing they didn't do was tell any of the rest of us. Instead, across this industry, they invested billions of dollars in building this architecture of deceit and denial and disinformation that was used for, for 30 years to spread what almost certainly is the most consequential lie in human history. We spent 30 years in a completely sterile debate about whether or not global warming was real, a debate that both sides knew the answer to at the outset. It's just that one of them was willing to lie. And that lie cost us the thing that we, the most valuable commodity in this whole thing, time. It cost us three decades that we won't get back, three decades that we'll be able to read in the geological record as long as there are geologists around. Uh, um, um, it, was, it, it was an act of, and continues to be, an act of just unspeakable um, violence. Um, continues to be, not because anybody with, you know, anybody sane is still really flat out denying climate change. You've really gotten past the point where anybody can sustain that argument. Um, but we uh, haven't changed that much. Now we just engage in other forms of climate denial that, you know, of extreme delay, uh, the kind of stuff that um, uh, uh, asks us to accept that, uh, you know, uh, some net zero target 40 years or 30 years in the future is an acceptable uh, response to the problem we find ourselves in now. Um, that, that little rant was all to set up this other good thing that's happened over the last 10 years. And that thing that's happened over the last 10 years is that um, we've built big movements as the engineers were doing their work to drive down the price of renewable energy, uh, so were activists learning how to build out big movements um, um, to weaken the power of the fossil fuel industry. Um, we got to start some of that work at 350.org, which you know began with myself and seven students here at Middlebury <clears throat> in Vermont. And, spread out to organize all over the world. We think we've organized about 20,000 rallies in every corner of the world except North Korea. Um, and, you know, we helped launch things like the fight against the Keystone Pipeline, finally successful this year, <clears throat> or, or this massive divestment movement that we are so glad that the CSU system is now fully a part of. Um, um, but the best news is just that so many other people have now taken up this work. And so we see the amazing sunrise movement that brought us the Green New Deal. We see things like Extinction Rebellion. We see most beautifully the rise of, of great climate activism among junior high and high school students around the world. Everybody knows Greta Thunberg and everybody should know Greta Thunberg. She's magnificent. She's one of my favorite people in the whole world to work with. I really adore her, <clears throat> but she would be the first to say, and if she wins the Nobel Prize tomorrow, I bet she will say uh, that the best news is there are 10,000 Greta Thunbergs scattered around the planet, and they have 10 million followers, and they are people who are just doing amazing, amazing work. So where that leaves us right now is in <clears throat> a different place than we've been before. 
I think in the roughest terms, the political power of this movement and the political power of the fossil fuel industry are roughly counterbalanced right now. Um, and you can tell that because say, look at Washington DC where uh, this reconciliation bill that would be the first, the Build Back Better bill that would be the first serious climate action that the US Congress has taken in the 30 years of, of uh, that we've known about the climate crisis, uh, it's roughly balanced 50, 50 well, 50, 48 to two in, in, uh, in you know, uh, uh, and, you know, Joe Biden ran for president talking a lot about climate change, saying we have to make a transition away from the oil industry using language that people haven't used before. But roughly balanced isn't good enough because we have to be able to route these guys if we're going to make change at the pace we need to make. Remember, the eventual outcome here is not at issue. 50 years from now, the world is going to run on sun and wind because it's clean and cheap. But if it takes us anything like 50 years to get there, the world that we run on sun and wind is going to be a broken world. So our job is to figure out how to move up, speed up that transition just as fast as we can. Um, there's lots of ways to do that. This huge divestment campaign being a good example. In recent years, that has morphed to um, include uh, 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 real questioning of the banks, insurance companies, and asset managers that are um, the financial lifeline for the fossil fuel industry. Um, um, my last trip out before the pandemic was to Washington, D.C., where I went to jail uh, for sitting in the lobby of the Chase Bank nearest the nation's capital with some friends because we were trying to launch this campaign against Chase. Why? Because they're the world's single largest lender to the fossil fuel industry. They've lent them a, almost a third of a trillion dollars in the six years since the Paris Climate Accords. They didn't need Donald Trump to sabotage it. They were quite happy to do it themselves. And so people are working hard to try and, and slow them down. Uh, 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 for instance, young people have called this fall for a real uh, uh, assault uh, uh, on those banks' policies. And uh, the Futures Coalition, if you Google them, is spinning up all kinds of good work that will culminate on October 29th with people inside and outside bank branches, Chase and Citibank branches across the country. And it's not just kids. Uh, uh, others of us are joining them too. As Jen said, my work at the moment is helping launch uh, a, a, a coalition of people over the age of 60 to take on uh, issues around progressive change, civil rights, but also climate work. And one of the first things we're doing is throwing down with young people. Um, just in case there's any other older people uh, uh, on this uh, uh, call tonight, um, you can check out the work we're doing at thirdact.org. And there's other people doing it too. Uh, um, I'm glad to see people in the chat talking about elders, climate action, and, and others. Um, this is really important that older people start backing up younger people in this work. Youth are leading on this fight, as you would expect, because they're the ones who are going to have to live with the damage their whole lives, you know. But they can't do it by themselves. Uh, so much of the political power in this country rests in those of us over the age of 60 because we vote like hell. And so much of the economic power rests with us because fairly or not, we've ended up in control of about 70% of the country's financial assets that if we don't get off the stick and join in, then it will not happen. And I think that it's possible that we will. Yes, it's true that people tend to become more conservative as they age, but this is a particularly interesting generation. Um, um, you know, it's first act, 
when back when we were uh, young, we were part of, or at least bore witness to, massive changes in the politics and culture of our country. The women's movement, the anti-war movement, the first Earth Day, the civil rights movement. If our second act was a little more about consumerism than citizenship taken as a whole, well, uh, we come out of that well equipped uh, with skills, with resources, with grandkids, and with real reason to try and keep our legacy from being the first generations that leave the world a much worse place than we found it. And uh, I, I, I will say that I have um, uh, my own sense that this is possible came from 10 years ago this summer at the beginning of this fight over the Keystone Pipeline. I wrote the the letter that asked people to come to Washington and join in the civil disobedience that helped kick off that national fight turned out to be the biggest civil disobedience action about anything in this country in a very long time. When I'd written that letter, I said, I didn't think young people should have to be the cannon fodder here. Um, because if you're, you know, 19, it's possible that a, a arrest record is not the very best thing for your resume. But, you know, past a certain age, what the hell are they going to do to you, you know? And I'll just add, since I'm speaking at a university, that if you happen to have tenure, this goes triple for you. You're the most bulletproof people that the earth has ever seen, you know, so you might as well put it to some use. Um, 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 at any rate, when people came to Washington in their thousands to go to jail, we didn't ask them how old they were. That would have been rude. But we did, I think, cleverly say, who was president when you were born? And the two biggest cohorts were from the FDR and the Truman administrations. Um, that was powerful to see. Uh, it was powerful for the young people that were there to see their elders acting the way we need elders acting if we're going to get out of these situations uh, uh, intact in any way. Um, I've talked for a long time and I want to get questions from you all. So let me just finish by saying that the vexed truth of it is we don't know if we're going to win, even if we do every damn thing right from this point on. Um, the physical momentum of these systems is very, very large. Um, and it's not a good sign that the Arctic has melted, you know. Um, um, we've set off some things that are that are beyond our abilities to uh, predict or control. Uh, but we do know that we're going to fight. I can guarantee that because I've spent the last couple of decades in motion around the planet talking to people all over the world who are engaged in this battle, many of them in places that had nothing to do with causing the crisis that we're now in, but nonetheless, they're willing to help in the fight again. And, and it's the greatest fight that humans have ever engaged in um, by far. Uh, and uh, on its outcome over the next few years hangs, hangs the fate of the poorest and most vulnerable people on the planet right now, hangs the fate of millions of other species, and hangs the fate of everything that's going to come after us. So it's worth doing everything that we can, more than we're doing now. The planet is way outside its comfort zone, so we need to be a ways outside our comfort zones, too, in taking this on. And I know that there are lots and lots of people there um, um, who are deeply engaged in that work. Uh, your part of the world has been one of the most important seedbeds of environmentalism for a very long time. And we're extraordinarily grateful to that all over the world. Um, and we need more. Um, and, and, and truthfully, we're just going to have to see what happens if we give it our all. Dr. King, my particular hero, used to end speeches by saying, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. This may take a while, but we're going to win. The arc of the physical universe is short and it bends toward heat. And if we don't win soon, we don't win. So that's why it seems so urgent to me, why we need to be all in. Um, and at this point, and here I really will end, let me just say that that all in 
doesn't have so much to do with your own individual life. Yes, there's lots of good things to do. I'm really proud of the fact that my house is covered with solar panels and they're connected to an electric car, but we're way past the point where we're gonna solve the math of climate crisis, one Tesla at a time, one vegan dinner at a time. The most important thing an individual can do is be less of an individual and join together with others in movements large enough to make this change in economic and political ground, rule, ground rules. And that's why it's so great that we have uh, all the different groups that we have and coalitions that we have that are working now to make this happen. Find one, join in, dig in, make your voice heard. If you've been keeping your powder dry for some reason, now is the time to put it to use. Um, we are up against it. It is a moment of extraordinary danger, but also of extraordinary excitement. Uh, it's a great burden for people in our time to have to deal with this, but at some other level, it's a great privilege and a great honor to get to be the generation that will make the difference and the decision about how far we go. So, I, I, I will, um, I, I'll stop there. We can talk about what's going on in Washington. We can talk about what's going on in Glasgow in a few weeks time, um, because those are the current instantiations of this great uh, 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 fight. Um, um, but mostly I just wanna say extraordinary thanks and especially the people who worked hard to get this divestment done because it's a big deal. So thank you all. And I'm sorry that I'm appearing to you out of this sort of half lit gloom. The internet went down at our house. So I'm halfway across town and borrowed desk uh, talking to you all. Um, um, but, and, and I realized that it, that it does not, it's not ideal, but there you are. Thank you, Bill. It's, um, kind of a nice backdrop to the gloom, but also that backlit light, uh, there you are. is a nice beacon for us all as we look to, as we look out to see how we address the biggest justice challenge the human race has ever experienced. Uh, it's almost like a Hudson River School painting from the romantic time where you have the dark and the light all in the same place. Very good. There you are. But um, let me start with a question, Bill. And then I know Arnie has a question. And then we'd like to um, offer some audience questions to you, too. But mine, mine is about justice and, and looking back at the, the history of our Western society as humans, we were culturally bound by tradition, you know, tra religious tradition, the, the tradition of democracy, even nature as a tradition or a stable physical system as some kind of tradition. And, and those traditions in some ways inhibited freedom. They prescribed a customary act. But now in this contemporary state, with so much in flux, we've been largely unmoored from these traditions. And now every decision is a negotiation. And sometimes with all this freedom, it seems we've sensed or we've lost a sense of how do we make decisions. And so I'm wondering what moral analytic or North Star or compass we use to guide us as we address the biggest challenge to justice the world has ever seen. Um, in other words, can we, if we can't reinvent or we can't invent our way or Tesla our way out of the climate crisis, then how do we reinvent ourselves? Is it being less of an individual? Is it- well, That's a, yeah, it's such a beautiful question, Jen. And I think you're moving right towards the answer there yourself. I think the inflection point in our history over, the la over my lifetime and, and really in world history, uh, 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 the place where things went uh, irrevocably wrong was probably uh, around the election of Ronald Reagan in the early 1980s, because it was a triumph of the idea that the only thing that mattered was you and a repudiation of the idea of human solidarity. Uh, Reagan, you know, famously kept saying the government is the problem, not the solution. And of course, government just means all of us, you know, working together. 
um, um, his famous laugh line for uh, decades in his speeches was the nine scariest words in the English language are I'm from the government and I'm here to help, you know, ha, ha, ha. It turns out the scariest words in the English language are either sorry, we've run out of ventilators or the hillside behind your house just caught on fire, you know, neither of which yield to a kind of uh, Ayn Randian libertarian uh, uh, response. And, and, you know, Reagan was more uh, symptom than cause, uh, you know, we'd been headed this way for a while, but that's when things crystallized and they've basically stayed that way ever since until I must say the present moment. And it is inspiring to watch the way that the kind of Bernie Sanders led revolution of 2016 has come to form or fruition in this remarkable reconciliation bill that the U.S. Senate is now considering, that Joe Biden is pushing. Trillions of dollars devoted not only to climate action, but to education, to health care, to housing. Uh, a return um, back way past, not a return to oh, the Obama era or the Clinton era, but a return to the LBJ era or maybe the FDR era, to an era when human solidarity really was important. And climate is a huge part of that. Uh, if that bill passes, if we can somehow figure out how to persuade Prime Minister Manchin and uh, uh, what's her name, uh, Kristen Cinema from Arizona, uh, if we can somehow persuade them to go along with the rest of the Democratic Party, then something quite remarkable will happen in this country. And equally as important, John Kerry will have something in his back pocket when he goes off to this conference in Glasgow in a few weeks. If they can't get it together, then I fret that we're going to go further down this path of dissolution and, and, and sort of um, uh, individual hyper-individualistic kind of um, craziness that very nearly took us down uh, 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 over the last four years. So to me, that, that the, 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 the strong distinction is between that hyper-individualism on the one hand and some kind of effective solidarity on the other hand. That to me is the great political schism in our world and the thing we most need to address. I, I am a, I confess, a Bernie partisan because, you know, I live in Vermont and he's an old friend, but I thought that the slogan of his campaign summed it up perfectly. Not me, us. If that was our national motto, uh, we'd be doing better than we're doing. Thanks, Bill. Uh, Arnie. Um, so I have a question that is um, maybe related to, to um, movement tactics and strategy, um, mm -hmm. which is, uh, I guess I'll frame it in a way that's a little bit too simplistic, but I think it's a useful way of just starting off the, the conversation, which is that when engaging with governments that take climate change seriously, um, one approach is to apply pressure to push for uh, greater ambition and to push for particular actions. Um, another approach is to um, take a more collaborative approach that is really about trying to open up political space uh, to, um, to allow that administration to take action. And I think it's... Uh, 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 maybe sometimes challenging if you're uh, working from an activist perspective to know when and where to take each approach, understanding that they're not, they're not, uh, I don't want to create a false binary here, but to, no, to, I think to, it's a fair binary. I mean, I think that the basic problem here, the basic structural problem all along has been that the fossil fuel industry has had such outsized political power that they've had an effective veto on interesting action at the federal level and often at the state level too. Um, you know, even California, progressive as it is, has had extraordinary difficulty in overcoming often the, the power of the fossil fuel industry uh, uh, to dictate policy. And so as that playing field begins to level some, then the possibilities open up more for different kinds of, of 
action and interaction. And we may see more of that in the next 10 years. Um, if the fossil fuel industry ever really becomes convinced that they're beaten at some level and that they're going to have to make basic concessions about their business plan and what it means, that they're going to end up having to leave some of their, a lot of their reserves in the ground, so on and so forth, then the possibilities for a certain kind of deal making, I suppose, get larger. But the work for the moment of activists has got to be above all to try and equalize that power differential. I mean, just think about it for a minute. By far the most important players in our political system for the last 25 years have been the Koch brothers, um, who were our biggest oil and gas barons. And they made enough money off their collection of pipelines and refineries and things that they bought a political party and managed to use that political party to completely end effective environmental regulation around things like climate change. Um, so it's the, the political task of, of dealing with that has been at the center of the, the resistance that we've been trying to mount, whether it's to fossil fuel expansion or whether it's through things like divestment. It's all been about a kind of shift in zeitgeist to the point where people realize that the normal and natural and obvious is not coal and gas and oil. It's sun and wind and conservation. Uh, thanks, and over, over to you, Jen. Do you want to follow up, Arnie, with that? Um, no, I think I think I think let's just keep moving because there's so many good questions coming in from the audience that I want to I want to move to that. Got it. Okay, great. Well, let me shift and focus on. Um, we've spoken some of the elder movements. Uh, we have several student, many students here, Bill, in the audience, and one student asks, "What advice do you have?" For the younger members of this movement, based on your experience, what do you think we should be doing? Well, look, young people are really doing the important work. I mean, you know, movement leadership has very much, that's where it's been this last decade. And it's been beautiful to watch and to be a small part of. One of the things, I mean, I'm very proud that we started 350 with myself and seven college kids. And I'm even more proud of the fact that the divestment movement directly um, bred the Sunrise Movement, that all the leaders that came up with the Green New Deal were people who'd cut their teeth on divestment, fossil fuel divestment while they were in college. So I, I you know, I mean, I think more of the same <laughs> would be a really important thing to do. Keep pushing really hard. Um, and there's beautiful work going on um, now around, as I said, financial institutions and around other kind of things that are peripheral to the fossil fuel industry. Uh, I was talking today with a group of young people who run this thing called Law Students for Climate Accountability. They've figured out what all the big law firms in the country are doing uh, to help the fossil fuel industry, and they're pledging not to work for the ones that are doing bad. People who work in journalism and, and uh, uh, public relations are now part of this huge clean creatives campaign to try and divorce uh, the communications industry from the fossil fuel industry, uh, on and on and on. I mean, the good news is that this fight is so broad and on so many fronts uh, around agriculture, around transportation, around that whatever it is you're good at or really have a passion for will be useful. Just make sure you save some time on after hours and on weekends, because that's when democracy gets done. You know, that's when citizenship gets done. And we need some basic level of that, of movement building, just to try and build this momentum higher still. Thank you. Arnie. I have a, a question that came in from Lorelai Walker, which is, uh, in your opinion, what commitments need to come out of COP26 for there to be real, effective, and rapid global change in the fight against climate change? Well, so the important topics at COP26 are going to be, can we increase the ambition of the crucial countries? Can we get the US, China, India to change their targets from Paris in measurable ways, speed up and deepen the pace at which they're cutting emissions? That'll be job one. Job two will be, can we come up with this climate finance that we've promised the developing world? 
Uh, at Copenhagen in 2009, Hillary Clinton said that the world would be providing by 2020 100 billion dollars a year from north to the south to uh, help them finance this transition. So far, that money hasn't appeared in those quantities. And the third, and this will be kind of emerging on the on the agenda. Uh, beyond that money to help finance the transition to clean energy, there's also an ever enlarging bill for what the technical, what they're calling loss and damage uh, uh, for the damage done to vulnerable places around the world that didn't cause this climate crisis and need somehow to be made, if not whole, then at least uh, whole enough to survive. And that's a lot of money. And there's been huge resistance from the West to paying it. Um, but I think it's going to increasingly become a central issue going forward. You can. Okay, another question from Marani Herrera. What is your personal experience working with indigenous communities in this fight? Indigenous communities have been at the absolute heart of this fight and punching unbelievably above their weight. Uh, uh, they're absolutely crucial players. The, I think the rest of the world, or at least the country, started catching on to that at Standing Rock, um, which was a remarkable demonstration of things and one of the most beautiful actions I've ever gotten to witness. But it didn't surprise me at all because I, I knew a great many of the people there already because of the work that they'd been doing uh, around Keystone and elsewhere. Uh, I got into that work on Keystone because great activists in Canada uh, native activists uh, had been working on this tar sand stuff for years. So my wonderful colleagues, Melina Lubicon Massimo, uh, Clayton Thomas Muller, other indigenous activists, and the ones who first brought my attention to that, and they're the people I've been working with forever. I'm looking forward next week to being in D.C. for this people versus fossil fuels demonstration. And stop one is a press conference. Everyone's doing it. The Army Corps of Engineers demanding action on this absurd line three pipeline through Minnesota. It's not just in U.S. and Canada where indigenous people are at the absolute forefront of this work. It's really around the world. So South America but also Australia, where Aboriginal people have been in the forefront of the fight against expanded coal mines and other destruction. And maybe most poignantly for me, uh, across the low-lying island nations of the world, where many of my favorite colleagues and most effective colleagues are, uh, people could Google the Pacific Climate Warriors. That's what 350.org in the Pacific has been called. All the people on those islands, uh, you know, Nauru, uh, uh, Tuvalu, Vanuatu, the Marshalls, the Solomons, uh, 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 so on and so forth, places that might not exist by the end of the century, some of them, um, but their slogan is, we're not drowning, we're fighting, and boy are they, and man has it been amazing to watch, so I, I, I think that uh, we'd have no chance on a lot of these fights without the remarkable leadership of Indigenous communities. I have a question that came in um, uh, asking about your perspective on lithium batteries. And um, the, the question is essentially, do you feel that lithium batteries are, are the answer or uh, as, a, as a storage technology? And do you think they're asking Arnie in a technical sense or are people worried about like lithium mining or what's the, what was your sense of the question? Uh, my, my, my guess is that there is a concern uh, about not not so much in a technical sense, but probably more in a resource and uh, and um, uh, other environmental concerns sense. Good, yeah, good. Um, so, just to say, on the on the kind of resource, on the kind of technical sense, uh, lithium batteries get better and cheaper all the time. But they're not the only thing that's going, and it's very exciting to watch in the course of this past year, the development of these iron. Um, uh, based batteries simply because iron is really cheap and plentiful. And though it's too heavy to use in a car, you can definitely use it as these big battery backups for utility scale uh, uses and things. Um, so lithium, let's talk about lithium, but also other things, rare earth minerals, cobalt, uh, uh, other things that are ingredients of the uh, technologies we're developing. Um, and that uh, uh, 
at the moment carry a fairly high human cost and environmental cost as they're mined and extracted. Um, we need to be paying serious attention to that and trying to reduce that cost as much as we can. Mining is always a harsh and dirty business. Um, and in the case of some of these things, cobalt in particular, it's you know the the fact that where this stuff is located, uh, uh, it, it makes it twice as bad because they're in places with poor governance, uh, human rights abuses, so on and so forth. We should be doing everything we can to make that as clean as we can um, in every way. Um, but we should not be slowing down its development. Um, because A, we face an absolute existential risk from climate change, unlike any other risk we've ever faced. B, the total burden of mining on the planet is, should drop dramatically as we move towards renewable energy. Uh, uh, you know, it takes a, 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 a fifth or less the amount of mining to, to power a... Um, uh, a renewable-based system, even with having to get lithium and rare earth minerals and stuff, than it takes to mine the constant supply of coal and other minerals that we need to keep the fossil fuel system going. And three, and this one is really, people need to bear this in mind because we forget it a lot. Even if the planet wasn't overheating, which it obviously is, uh, uh, burning fossil fuel is one of the stupidest things we do uh, and most unjust things we do just in other ways. New data this year shows that 8.7 million people a year around the earth die from breathing the combustion of fossil fuels, breathing the particulates. 8.7 million, obviously heavily concentrated among the poorest and most vulnerable people on earth. That's more than HIV, AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis combined. And it's not necessary because we now know how to produce necessary power without burning that stuff. So yes, it's really important to try and take seriously the human rights and environmental problems that come around things like lithium mining, but always remember to hold them up against the deep human problems that come with the current system and the existential problems the existential disaster that arises if we don't somehow get a hold of climate change sooner rather than later. So Bill, we're just popcorning across various topics. This one is, is back to um, oil and um, big oil in particular. And, and one member of the audience is asking this question, which is, while big oil has been named several times throughout the presentation, it still is an abstract concept. Can you point to direct action items that have been directed to destabilize their political power? For example, I know they receive billions in subsidies, but are there other aspects we could tackle? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's that's why I talk so much about divestment. I mean, they're they're you know. It's caused them enormous problems, uh, Exxon, Chevron, Shell, BP, the rest, to have people um, uh, going after the pool of investment capital on which they depend. Shell, two years ago in its annual report, uh, uh, said that divestment had become an existential risk to its business, which is great because Shell's business is an existential risk to life on planet Earth, you know, Um, um um, so that's one very good way. And if we could slow down the flow of bank money to them, that would be another really strong way to go after these guys. Obviously, serious federal regulation would help. Uh, you know, there's been big calls to end fossil fuel subsidies. Uh, Joe Manchin said last week that he would not allow that in the bill before Congress. So it may be a while before that happens. It's certainly something that many of us have worked on for a very long time. Um, in general, anything that makes it easier to put up more renewable energy faster um, helps to stabilize the fossil fuel industry um, because you know they're 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 under assault from two directions. Uh, you know, since their product is destroying the planet, they're obviously going to keep coming under regulatory and activist pressure and other people have figured out how to provide the same product power just 
cheaper and cleaner. So eventually they're completely out of luck, but all they're playing for is another decade or two, prolonging their business model as long as they can. The problem with that is that it's the same decade or two that'll determine whether or not the planet gets out of this thing uh, uh, half intact or not. We'll jump over to uh, a question that is um, one that that multiple people have have submitted, which is um, acknowledging that there's a lot of anxiety um, uh, that comes up around these topics. Uh, so, how does one balance uh, all of these feelings? How do you manage uh, yeah. with climate crisis fatigue, and how do you keep yourself going? Well, that's a good question, and. I may be the wrong person to ask because I may have, it's possible I've just been doing this so long that I've sort of, uh, you know, I don't know. There's days when I'm not hopeful and when I just, it seems enough to just figure out how much trouble I can cause the bad guys, you know, and that's enough to incentive to get one through the day. I do think that it's really important that we um, pay attention to the beauty that remains in the world. And this is an extraordinarily beautiful world that we still inhabit. You guys are in one of its prettiest parts. I got to tell you this week, there's no place on planet earth more beautiful than the mountains of Vermont. Uh, the leaves are at absolute peak color. And so I've made it a point to just shut down for an hour or two every day and get out and, and soak in them. Um, because, well, for me, that helps me get through. And I'll just add that the other therapy that seems to work for me is um, uh, getting involved in the fight. Um, you know, a a a as always, you feel, uh, 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 it feels a little less bad if you feel like you're um, uh, pouring some water on the fire. Okay, another question. Um, Frank Luntz, uh, prime influence on climate communications and the, the take up, uh, popular take up of the term climate change. Um, the, Ronnie Schwartz is saying, while well, he did this to assist Republicans, it's now being used by folks across political positions. Do you recommend this term climate change rather than global warming or global heating or something else? I think it's I, what I've been calling it for years now, what I called my New Yorker newsletter when I was doing it, all that is a climate crisis. And I think that's, uh, I mean, um, um, that's the language I'd use. And, and I'm happy to see more and more newspapers and things kind of using that as, a, as the correct description. So for me, that's probably the, but I'm so old that I remember when we called it the greenhouse effect, you know, so. And why do you think that's the correct term? Can you elaborate? Well, I mean, I think it's the correct term because I think it's the most accurate term. I mean, we're yeah. in a deep, deep crisis and it's important to understand that. Um, and, you know, and it's important to understand that in part because when you're in a crisis, then you take actions that different than if you're not, you know, um, um, you work single-mindedly and quickly and, and, at risk to yourself and whatever when you're in a crisis. So uh, this is another question that comes in um, from uh, multiple people. Um, and I guess first I'll just say that lots of comments are coming in that are uh, expressing just a lot of appreciation. So a lot of thank yous. Uh, Good. Um, so the question is, uh, do you have any advice for student attendees who are about to graduate? Uh, what are some of the organizations or programs you would re recommend applying to or uh, that, that do climate change work? And then uh, on a similar vein, what environmental professions do you see as um, having the most potential to, to uh, make a difference in this, uh, in this crisis? These are really interesting questions. Um, you know, I was thinking yesterday when they gave the uh, Nobel in physics to uh, Manabe and some of the other very early pioneers of this work that, um, you know, when we used to think about uh, 
uh, climate change, the kind of disciplines that came to mind were physics and chemistry and things. And those had a very honorable and important, crucial role in uh, giving us an understanding of it. But they're probably not where the real action is at this point. Uh, most of what we need to know uh, about the basic science, we kind of understand at this point. And the places we're much less wise about are all those things about how to make change. Um, so sociology, psychology, political science, um, um, you know, economics uh, are probably you know, some of the, the really governing um, disciplines for the, the time ahead as we try to make swift change. And, um, and, and so I think that I'd be tempted to be looking in those directions. Uh, I'll say this, if you happen to be and Arnie, you know some of these people. If you happen to be a kind of bench engineer who's capable of uh, of making a solar panel five percent more efficient in the next decade, then just do that and do nothing else than that. And the rest of us will bring you, you know, pizza and diet coke, and and keep you at work because really nothing's more important than continuing that ongoing fall in the price an increase in the power of renewable energy. But if that's not your jam, and for most of us, it's not, um, there are a lot of other really important ways to dig in and get change done here. But I'll just repeat my uh, other call, which is whatever you're doing with your nine to five, just make sure it doesn't take 80 hours a week out of you because we need you we need you on weekends and we need you in some evenings doing the work of democracy, of movement building that's outside the thing that most people are ever going to get paid for. Bill, let's turn to fiction for a minute. One question from Mark Larson is, dystopian science fiction has long described the effects of climate change and overpopulation on societies. Have you read any more positive fiction on a path forward? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, the great science fiction of this year is uh, Kim Stanley Robinson's wonderful Ministry for the Future. Uh, I'm a huge fan of his. He's been writing about, in a certain sense, been writing about political action on climate change since he wrote Red Mars, Blue Mars, Green Mars 30 years ago. I interviewed uh, Stan for the, who's one of your fellow Northern Californians, by the way. Um, I interviewed him for the New Yorker Radio Hour a few weeks ago. Um, and, and he said, you know, I'm a utopian science fiction writer, uh, but utopia in the 21st century means avoiding mass extinction. <laughs> so, so it's not like Ministry for the Future is a, uh, you know, it's 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 not, it's not like a whimsical, uh, you know, uh, right? But it is. It it offers a very coherent set of uh, understandable uh, steps that all all of which will be of big help here. He's absolutely on top of the science, the economics, and the politics of climate change in a way that almost no other writer, fiction or nonfiction that I can think of really is. Sounds like I just uh, got a recommendation for my next book. <laughs> um, this is a question that came in from James Fitzgerald. Um, uh, and it is, um, so as we build stricter regulatory processes to protect the environment, particularly under CEQA and NEPA. Um, do you have suggestions for how to streamline the historically time-consuming process of policy so as to address both democracy and the need for fast and large-scale in, uh, uh, installation of renewable energy? Say that once more, how to streamline? Um, it's a, uh, how to streamline the historically time-consuming process of of policy, or I think the right. uh, of the policy. That's a very, process. very good question. Um, it's a very good question. Look, our our uh, even our best political systems are really set up to move slowly. Um, that's one of their defining features, and it comes out of this idea about checking and balancing government at all times, and so on and so forth. And sadly, uh, the opponents of environmental progress have learned how to use the environmental laws. Uh, to their advantage to slow things down yet more. Um, and that's a huge problem because we do not have 
eight years, 10 years, whatever, to go through each of these, you know, uh, and, and it just gives me, gives me kidney stones to watch people uh, figuring out how to delay putting up a wind turbine or a solar panel year after year after year of using NEPA or whatever it is. Um, one of the few ways to cut through things fairly quickly sometimes is the use of executive action uh, uh, by the administration. And there are places where that can really help. Um, you know, so one hopes that uh, uh, once we're through this budget stuff, that perhaps the Biden administration will start doing things like really figuring out how to stop the leasing of new uh, uh, drilling rights on public lands and so on and so forth. Um, but, you know, that that <laughs> electing people who will push bureaucrats to do things at a faster pace is really crucial. One of the things that makes me very worried about the next eight years, I have to say eight or 10 years, is that with the Supreme Court um, in the hands of kind of revanchist uh, retrograde thinking, it may be very difficult to get a lot of federal action uh, upheld in the long run. So Bill, um, thinking about the third act.org and your friends over 60 and those in the audience today that, that relate to that. Um, You'll all be there one day, Jen. I, well, I'm close, Bill. I'm 41. So I'm, I feel like- well, You're almost you're almost there. You're tiptoeing <laughs> up to it, yeah. Um, many older folks, this is an anonymous question, but they're, they're saying many older folks that they've talked to have said that they'll be gone before climate change really affects them. What would be your advice when talking to those who don't believe that climate change is their problem too, especially potentially elders that may not be live, alive as the existential crisis really becomes lived? Well, I mean, there's some truth to that. This is obviously far worse for people who are 18 than people who are 80. Uh, uh, it, it, you know, unless those people who are 80 have a uh, heart and soul, um, at which point it's almost unbearable for them too, um, and maybe more so, because as we get nearer the exits, our chance for changing things gets slimmer, you know, the time in which we have to do it. And we're forced to grapple with the realization, as I was saying before, that we may be the first generations to leave the planet a worse place than we found it. And if you have kids, grandkids, or a conscience, that is a a, a terrible, terrible indictment. So, I, you know, that's what I would say to people. Um, it behooves us enormously to be backing up young people in their fight here, and we can do it in really powerful ways. Um, um, I'm excited about working with people my age on this because um, I, I, I think they bring particular strengths, including um, uh, a memory of. Uh, a country whose polity works better than ours works at the moment, and and perhaps some willingness to demand that it shape up and get back to producing change in, in the ways that we need. I think this is a in a similar vein, which is how do you communicate with someone who still thinks that climate change is a is a conspiracy? I don't think you. I, I wouldn't put much hope in it. I mean, we're coming up on Thanksgiving. Do not ruin your Thanksgiving dinner trying to convince your crazy uncle about climate change because it's not going to work. Uh, if you'd spent the last you know thirty years marinating in Rush Limbaugh, you'd be crazy too. And you know, you're, it's not like the next article in Nature or Science or something's going to turn the corner for him. Um, that said. There aren't that many of them anymore. We're at something like 70% or more of the American population that understands we're facing a real problem here. And that's in America, a huge number, uh, you know, in a society as divided as ours. We've really won in many ways this public opinion battle. So don't worry about your uncle, but do go to work on your sweet aunt, you know, who probably is a little worried about uh, what's going to happen with her grandkids. Um, um, because what we need to do is take some significant percentage of that 70% and turn them from people who are worried about climate change into people who are acting on climate change. 
And that's the real fight. I, I, I just, I don't think there's any real way to deal with people who are at this point are still deep in conspiratorial thinking and, and so on. Um, um, it's one of the unfortunate features of our age. And we've just got to figure out how to mobilize people of good heart in sufficient numbers that it can't drag us all down. Okay, Bill, I think we have two two more questions, one from the audience, and then I'm gonna ask a final question. All right, fair. <laughs> and then you can go <laughs> at 8.30 p.m. Um, Bedtime in Vermont. To your yeah. bed, yeah. The first question is from a professor here at HSU, John Meyer. He asks, what do you see the impact of experience of the COVID pandemic is having, and, and how is it shaping possibilities for action on the climate crisis? So it's a really good question, uh, Professor Meyer. Um, several answers. One, uh, just in very straightforward terms, it was a strong reminder of what I was trying to say before about the limits of individual action. You know, at the height of the pandemic in the spring of 2020, people changed their behavior far more radically than any environmentalist has really ever, I think, thought people actually would. Everybody stopped driving, everybody stopped flying. Um, and yes, carbon emissions fell, but really not by that much, 10 or 12% at the height, which was a pretty good indication that there are strong limits to individual behavior change here, that an awful lot of the damage is in the guts of the system. And we're gonna have to reach into the guts and pull out the coal and gas and oil and put in conservation and efficiency and renewables. Um, um, so that was useful to know. In other terms, COVID was a powerful reminder that physical reality is real, which is something that we tend to forget in a world mediated by screens all the time. I've spent 30 years trying to convince people that chemistry and physics are unlikely to compromise or negotiate with us on climate change. And that was brought home for biology with COVID. Didn't matter what you're wanted out of this, the molecule, you know, the, the, the microbe was setting the rules. And if it was saying wear a mask, then wear a mask or else you're gonna end up in big trouble, you know? So that's a good reminder. Second reminder, kind of a corollary of that is those who move quickly do well. Uh, people who responded to try and flatten the, the COVID curve early on, Korea, Taiwan, places like that, uh, did much better than those of us who waited uh, a crucial month or two on the theory that it would all go away by Easter or whatever it was that they were thinking in the Trump administration. Um, and once you get behind curves, they're extremely difficult to get out. But I think the third, the biggest one is the one that I was alluding to before, that that really it's a powerful reminder that human solidarity is necessary. Uh, that when people work together to do even rudimentary things, wear masks, distance themselves a little bit, behave like adults, uh, remarkable change can happen fairly quickly. And when they don't, when they absolutely insist on asserting their own uh, hyper individual view of the world, their own uh, uh, commitment to freedom, uh, you know, defined as not having to care about anybody else, then everybody gets in trouble quickly. And so one hopes that some, you know, sense of solidarity will, you know, that people will understand that that was a useful thing. But who knows, because that, uh, you know, um, I mean, because there is a large percentage of our population, sadly, whose motto for life seems to be, you're not the boss of me, uh, which is a difficult motto under which to operate if you want to have a working society. Okay, thank you. And, and last question, it's going to be about justice as the first question I asked was, and it's looking ahead to Glasgow and the COP coming up and this IPCC target of 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius and to, to reconcile that those targets have human rights consequences that are largely ignored mm -hmm. um, by the popular media and even the legal and policy community and I, I'm wondering about, have you thought about this? Is this goal or target discriminates against those most vulnerable to climate change impacts 
those low lying islanders, for example, that may not be able to have a state if we get to 1.5 degrees. Many of those communities have advocated for one degrees um, or 350 ppm, for example. So how do we deal with these consensus driven targets when they have discriminatory effects and the human rights implications of this global climate policy? If, if well, the goal is justice, like how do we include everyone? Sure. I mean, first of all, thank heaven that those uh, people in those communities have been pushing hard because that's why we have the targets that we have. 1.5 degrees came directly out of the global south, um, out of African and low-lying Pacific Island nation or nations. I remember in Copenhagen when the very first chance went up from some of us, 1.5 to stay alive. And it was viewed as absurd then, but by Paris, people managed to force it into the preamble to that agreement, and it's become a driving part of the fight here. Is it enough? No, of course not. I mean, I started an organization called 350.org to demand that that's where we end up. We're at 420 now parts per million CO2. Um, um, but, uh, you know, I mean, you, it, it, it's fine to demand that the temperature not rise more than one degree, but it's already risen more than one degree. And and that's where we are. Uh, anything we can do to hold it down, any tenth of a degree turns out to be the difference between survival for hundreds of thousands of people and absolute misery for hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, so that's the fight. Uh, anything we can do. Um, um, and we've got to do as much as we possibly can, which is not what the world is engaged in now. The powers that be in the world are still engaged in this kind of bargaining to see how little they can get away with, not how much they can do. And our job is to force them off that position and into this one where they're working at speed to change things, despite the fact that it's politically uh, inconvenient for them to have to do it. We have to make it more inconvenient for them not to do it. That's what organizing is about. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, an enormous thank you for um, the conversation tonight and an even bigger one for, um, for being in that fight day after day after day. Uh, well, we really appreciate all that, uh, all that you do. Back at y'all and um, keep it up there. And I'll look forward to getting back to those beautiful green forests and um, and seeing all the work that y'all are up to. But you guys do great stuff. And I'm so grateful. Arnie, Jen, everybody else. Thank you very much. You are, of course, welcome here anytime. And uh, we, we look forward to that. All right. God bless. Bye, Bill. Thanks.